there. I know you all know how to use the internet because otherwise you wouldn't be viewing this video or viewing me live right now. But have you wondered how is all that data traveling from my computer to yours? How are we getting all these videos? How is any information traveling over the internet? Does it all go at once? Does it always work? Does everything get there all the time? Does it matter what device you're using or who the manufacturer is of your device? Well, NCS principles, that is one of our topics, big idea for the internet. And we're gonna review that tonight as well as look at um, some of the different types of computing procedures for huge problems. I'm so glad you're here. I'm Sandy Chika, and I can't wait to work with you right now on reviewing Big Idea for the Internet. So what are we going to learn tonight? Well, one of the things that we definitely want to do is talk about this feedback form. So this is the form that you can use to give us feedback about how we're doing, as well as to ask questions. HTTPS colon slash slash tinyurl.com slash APCSP 2021 feedback. We can use that feedback form. And I'm also going to go into this review. This review takes you into the Google Drive that has some information. So the same tinyurl.com slash APCSP 2021 review. So I'm going to go over and get onto the other side of my internet here and talk to you about a few things. So on this feedback form, and just to remind you, it looks like this. Some of you might have asked a few different questions. And so I wanted to talk about a few of the questions. So one of the most common things people wanted to know about is the create performance task. Now, as you know, the create is worth 30% of your AP score. The eight videos during this two week review, we are focusing on the multiple choice section, which is 70% of your score. However, I didn't want to ignore your question. So in the folder, I have resources for APCS principles. And I put in there a link that has Crystal Furman from the College Board doing a deep dive into the Create Performance task, including directions, guidelines, and the submission process. So this is an excellent, excellent resource because she knows everything about the performance task and shares some wonderful information with you. I also put a PDF of the Digital Portfolio User Guide for Students. So this might answer some of your questions about navigating the digital portfolio. I also put a link to handouts about the create task. Hopefully you already received these from your teacher, but you know, maybe they got misplaced or maybe you don't quite have them right now. So I just wanna make sure that you can access, this will give you all of the directions as well as the prompts for the written responses. So those are all um, information about the create task that I thought might help to answer some of your questions. I also wanted to, I know some of your questions were about more details from the last couple days of topics that we covered. So I put a link, um, the details about each session of the reviews and which topics are addressed each day. So this link has a list of all eight reviews. The link here will take you to the on-demand video. It'll tell you a bit brief description and there is a list of topics for each one. So for instance, tonight, we're covering topics 4.1, 4.2, and 4.3. If you go into AP Daily or into AP Classroom, and it looks like I got logged out, so I'm gonna log back in. If I go into APCS Principles, just take a moment here. On the main page, you can see the different big ideas. On each big idea, you will see for each topic, daily videos. These are anywhere from about six to 10 minutes. And so you can look at the specific topics that maybe you wanna get more details about. I also wanna mention that if you go over on the far right to this review tab and click on that, you will see four more videos about the create performance task. Dan Bonarigo published these videos that talk about each of the different written response prompts and give you information about how to answer them as well as how they will be scored. So I'm hoping that this will all help you with more resources that you might find useful. 
Some other questions that were asked uh, in the feedback form was about the composite score. So based on what grade you get, how many you get correct, how will you know if you get a five, four, three, two, or one? Well, this will vary um, from test to test. So it, uh, there's different cut scores that are unique to each of the exams that are given. So there's not a set number that will guarantee, but you can get an approximation. If you do the 2021 practice exam, your teacher can give you a, an approximation to what that will be. So you want to talk to your teacher about the 2021 practice exam and she or he could look up the estimated scores that they gave for five, four, three, or two. Um, a few of you asked about having access to our presentation. You will have access to all these videos. In fact, the videos are accessible um, on demand immediately pretty much after our live, uh, within moments at least, after our live performance here. Um, but you will not have direct access to the slides. The College Board does though provide the access to the videos. Uh, a few people have been asking about writing on the exams. So if you're taking the pencil and paper exam, you may write anywhere on the exam, uh, but your answers have to go on the answer sheet. If you are taking the digital version of the exam, you are allowed to have scratch paper and encouraged to use scratch paper as you are working through some of the questions, especially some of the uh, programming questions we find that's really useful. Specifically, someone asked me about the topic that I cut, one part of the topic I covered uh, on Tuesday, the Creative Commons. Um, we only need to be worried about the Creative Commons license. So I was only referring to the Creative Commons license, not the Creative Commons organization. So we only need to know about the Creative Commons license. And I did mention that citing should happen whenever you use anyone else's material. Um, although many copyrights will require the use of citation, sometimes you might not be required, but you always should cite your uh, use of someone else's work. So I just wanted to cover those. I'm not ignoring your feedback. I am reading it and I'm hoping that I will be able to cover more and more things. I know some of you asked about, will we be covering other things on the internet like security? And I believe that's gonna be covered um, actually on Monday with Julia Lano. So in this video, we're gonna cover how the internet works the importance of fault tolerance and the use of parallel and distributed computing for solving larger problems. So specifically the topics that we will cover today are um, explaining how computing devices work together in a network, how the internet works, how data are sent through the internet via packets, and describing the differences between the internet and the World Wide Web. We will also look at um, looking at fault tolerance systems like the internet, the benefits of fault tolerance, and how a given system is fault tolerant, and vulnerabilities to failure in a system. And parallel and distributed computing, we're going to look at sequential and parallel computing in detail and talk a little bit about distributed computing, comparing problem solutions, efficiency of solutions. The skills that will normally be covered as questions are asked in this particular to uh, these particular topics have to do with evaluating solution options and explaining how computing systems work. Just to be clear, this big idea, computer system and networks, is approximately 11 to 15 percent of the AP exam weighting on the multiple choice section. There may be, there will be some single select multiple choice questions, and you may have some multi-select multiple choice questions on this, these topics. All right, so let's review a little bit. Of course, like we have been doing, we wanna talk about vocabulary. So I do encourage you to maybe write down some of these words. You don't have to write down the whole definition. You could look them up later again to practice, or you can always go back and watch the video again and pause, maybe make your own set of flashcards. So a computing system is a group of computing devices and programs working together for a common purpose. This could be in one building, or it could be a whole network with interconnected computing devices capable of sending and receiving data. So computing network is a type of computing system. 
A sequence of directly connected computing devices from a sender to receiver is a path. So we might have multiple connections through different computers or routers to eventually make a path from a sender to a receiver. Routing is the process of finding a path that is best served from the sender to the receiver. The bandwidth of a computer network is the maximum amount of data that can be sent in a given amount of time. Usually this is measured in bits per second, abbreviated BPS. Bandwidth was actually affecting a lot of us in the last year. If you had multiple people in your home who were all working from home or going to school from home, or even sometimes in schools, now that more and more computers are being used in schools, with the internet, sometimes the bandwidth needs to be increased. Protocols are essential for the internet. These are agreed upon set of rules that specify the behavior of a system. So internet protocols are open. What that means is every, all the manufacturers, all the devices can use them. In fact, they must use them. So it doesn't matter who, uh, what type of device you're on or what manufacturer has made your device. They will all use the internet protocol so that all different devices from all different types of manufacturers can all communicate with each other. So IP, internet protocol, which sometimes deals with your addresses, TCP, transmission control protocol, and UDP, user data, datagram protocol, are common ones used on the internet. Scalability, scalability is the capacity for the system to change in size and scale to meet demands. So remember, when the internet first started, it was very small. Most people didn't have their own email. Heck, a lot of people didn't even have computers in their homes. Eventually, the internet had to keep scaling up and up to be able to handle not only almost everyone having their own email address, but also so many people having not just one computer, but multiple computers or devices all connected to the internet. Packets are small amounts of data sent over the internet. So we will see that when we are sending information, whether it's a video or whether it's a text or anything, that what's sent over the internet will, contain, will be broken up into smaller packets containing data with the actual information being sent, as well as metadata that includes the sources and destination, as well as the data needed for reassembly. What order does it have to go in? The World Wide Web. Now, let me be clear. The World Wide Web and the internet are not synonyms. The wide, World Wide Web is a system of linked pages, programs, and files. HTTP is a protocol used by the World Wide Web to send GET and POST messages in order for the information to be sent to and from places. In essence, the World Wide Web uses the internet to send the data. Now, an important aspect of the internet working is redundancy, having extra components that can be used to mitigate failure of a system if other components fail. A system is considered fault tolerant when it can support some failures and still can continue to function. Oops. All right, so I made a little example of the internet being used. So let's see if we can take a peek at that together. So here's my mini internet system. We have a sender on a computer and a receiver. And in between, there are computers, some of them may be router, the routers and such, that will help send our information from the sender to the receiver. Remember, we just talked about a few moments ago that the data is not sent all at once. It's broken up into packets. Each packet has part of the data, as well as metadata about who's the sender, who's the receiver, their IP addresses as well as the order they need to go in. To represent my packets, I'm using some rubber ducks. So the particular message I'm sending, I am using an example of just having three packets. So our cool little shaded ducks to, over the, to find a path and to be routed to the receiver. So here we go. Notice these ducks. 
don't necessarily all follow each other. They did not all take the same path, but they did eventually get there. Something like TCP or UDP might check in to see, did we get everything? And depending how their protocol works, we'll somehow make sure that they are in order. In this case, all three ducks got there. They all managed to get to the receiver. So we are happy with all three packets and all is good. Well, let's look at another example. Again, I'm gonna use three packets just to keep it simple. And I'm gonna try to route them to the receiver. So here we go. There they go. Uh-oh, two, 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 where did you go, two? Two, uh-oh, two is missing. Oh, two, what did you do? Imagine if that's like a key part of your movie, a key part of your video. Well, don't worry, one of our protocols will check. This protocol noticed we got one, but we did not get packet two. We did get three. So we can have two resent. And depending, this will be done in different ways depending which protocol is used, but we can get two over there. And when we check again, one and three were already there, and now two is there. So we're much happier, all is good. Whew, and two is safe, no ducks were hurt in this example. All right, so now I'm not gonna worry so much about moving the ducks, but I wanted to look at these different connections. So we have direct paths, as well as then those paths can be put together to eventually route all the way to the receiver. Well, what if this path goes away? What if this connection between this router and computer go away? Well, that's all right. Because of redundancy, we still maintain fault tolerance because there are other paths that can be used to route our packets, our ducks to the receiver. So that direct link went away. This direct link went away. Are we still fault tolerant? Well, yes, I don't have as many options, but I can still get, find a route that will definitely get me from the sender to the receiver. Uh-oh, just lost another one. Well, it's definitely gonna get a little more backed up. The traffic might get a but we still have fault tolerance because I can still get messages between the sender and receiver. Another one went down. It's okay. Not good, probably gonna slow down a lot because if we get to this router, he's just gonna have to go, any packets will just have to go back to eventually get on this path. But now once this one went away, we've lost our fault tolerance, all right? But because of redundancy, we were in pretty good shape for quite a while. We had to eliminate several direct paths before we lost our fault tolerance to have a path all the way from the sender to the receiver. So we can see how redundancy really helps us. Also, we can see when we have more computers and more routers, we get more connections, hopefully. That helps us with our scalability because as we have more traffic on the internet, we need more paths. It's just like a city. If we have more people who are traveling around, we need more roads. We need more options or larger roads. So we have an idea now of what's going on behind the scenes for the internet. But now let's look at what about some of our really large problems we wanna solve. For some of these problems, they might be really huge. How can we solve them? What computational models are out there to solve problems in an efficient way? So I'm gonna go back to some vocabulary. This particular topic is new to the AP exam in terms of uh, specific content for 2021. So this is something I really wanna make sure we go over. Sequential computing is a computational model in which operations are performed in order one at a time. So we just do things one thing after another. The time it takes to finish the whole process is the sum of all the steps. So I do step one and then two and then three and then four. So however long it takes me to do each step, I sum up. Parallel computing is a computational model where the program is broken into multiple smaller sequential computing operations, some of which can be performed simultaneously. 
So some operations might need something to happen beforehand, so those have to stay sequential, but some can be done at the same time. So when we do that, we can actually save some time, hopefully. The time it will take for parallel computing is the time it takes for the sequential tasks plus the longest of its parallel tasks. We're going to look at an example of this in a moment. Distributed computing is a model in which the multiple devices are used to run a program. So not only can we do it with a parallel, but we can actually distribute it to other computers. In the exam, you might hear the term the speed up of a parallel solution. This is going to be measured in the time it took to complete the task sequentially, divided by the time it took to complete the task when done in parallel. So I have an example that's kind of interesting. So imagine that I am going to be grading the computer science performance tasks. That's quite a daunting task in and of itself. So the first thing I might need to do is determine a scoring rubric and train myself on it. I'm going to estimate that will take me 60 minutes. Then I'm going to start scoring the individual performance tasks. So I do the first one, and it takes me 10 minutes. I do the next one, it takes me 15. The next one takes me another 15 minutes. The another one takes me 20 minutes. A fifth one takes me 10 minutes, and a sixth one takes me 20 minutes. Now, obviously, there's a lot more people than just six doing this performance task, but just to get this far, it took me 150 minutes to do this sequentially because I can only grade them one at a time. Well, I'm never going to get through them. You're never going to get your scores if that's the way I'm doing it. So I need to find a better way. I'm going to get some friends to help me. So I know there's some other teachers who know computer science at my school, so I'm going to get them to help me. So no matter what, I first need to start with get, making the rubric and training myself and actually my friends on it as well. So I'll still say that first step is going to take 60 minutes. But now here come my friends. Here comes my little army of CS teachers. And I'm going to give each of them two performance tasks to grade, and they can grade these at the same time. So this little character here is going to score two tasks, and it will take this little character 25 minutes. This smiling teacher up here is getting two different exams, and they will take a total of 35 minutes. And this little cutie teacher down here is going to take about 30 minutes for these two. So working together, it will take us 95 minutes in total to grade these tests if we work in parallel. Why is it 95? Well, the 60 minutes initially, and then I need the longest. These three people are working at the same time. The longest one takes 35 minutes. And so all together, it'll take 35 minutes to have everything done. These two will be done faster, but still I won't be totally done with the six performance tasks until the last one is graded. So that will be 95 minutes if we work in parallel. So a definite improvement over 150 minutes. In fact, the speed up of the parallel solution would be 150 divided by 9.95, which is 1.579. Now, clearly, this still would take way too long. So we would want to use a distributed model. And in fact, that is actually what happens. Some people work initially to set up the rubric and set up training. Then, we have teachers distributed all over the United States who are all grading the exam. So first they're trained, and then they're able to go out and grade exams at the same time. That's the way we're able to get all of your performance tasks graded in about a week's time, maybe a little longer. In fact, maybe one of your teachers is doing some of the grading this year. So this is really the idea of sequential versus parallel versus distributed computing. The difference is we're talking about computers and their processors instead of the people. So I hope you have a little better idea. So let's do some practice. So I'm going to have you start to get involved now. So you're going to go to www.kahoot.it. In a moment, I will show you the join code. 
I also have these questions in a PDF in the review folder in that Google Drive. So in case you're not able to access Kahoot for some reason, or if you want to go back later and look at the questions again, you'll have access to it. So I'm going to get back into the internet. And here we go. So I'm going to go ahead so you can join Kahoot dot IT and the game pin is 4387999. So let's see if we can get some players in here to have a little fun and get involved and stay engaged. Remember, this is not all about getting everything right. This is about learning and just getting stronger at our at what we're actually doing. Again, these questions will be available afterwards, so you can go back and look at them again. Practice them some more. You might even want to bring them to your teacher. They all are on AP Classroom, so your teacher does have access to all of these questions. And they're going to be able to help you answer them as well in case you have additional questions. We've got all kinds of interesting people coming in now. Lucky Lemming, Smart Quail, Agent Crane, Daring Leopard, Sturdy Alpaca, Bright Zebra. Wow, we got all kinds of good ones coming in. All right, so give it a couple more moments here to get as many people in as possible. I see a lot of people still coming in, so I'm just holding on for just a moment. Woohoo, Space Bison, Power Bobcat, Magic Giraffe. We've got some wonderful options here. So for each question, I'm giving you 90 seconds approximately. I know sometimes the delays can be a little different, but hopefully that'll be enough time for you to read it and give your best answer that you can come up with. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Which of the following best explains how data is typically assembled in packets for transmission over the internet? So as you're thinking, I encourage you to consider some things. Are there any pieces here we could eliminate? All right, do packets have to be encrypted? No, they don't. Only if they're on a secure network, parts of them might be. Do we bundle them together? Hmm, were those ducks all bundled together? Did we tie them up? Are we only sending metadata in them? I'm not sure. Does the data go along with metadata about information used for routing? So when you're looking at questions, look to see what can you eliminate if you're not sure of what the answer is to start with. All right, we're going to be ending almost any moment now. So yes, each packet contains data to be transmitted along with the metadata containing information used for routing the data. And B, it does not necessarily have an encrypted version of the data unless we're on a secure channel if we've used secure protocol. And C, each packet contains only the metadata. Well, if we only have the metadata, then we're never going to actually get the information like the video or whatever we're looking at. And the packet might contain multiple pieces of data. However, we're not bundling them together. OK, so our answer was the red triangle. All right, so here we have our leaderboard. Lovely Newt on top, followed by Soaring Sea Lion Agile. Oh, Agile Ibex, Jolly Dolphin, and Expert Meerkat. Our next question. 
So a certain computer has two identical processors that are able to run in parallel. Each processor can run only one process at a time, and each process must be executed on a single processor. The following table indicates the amount of time it takes to execute each of the three processes on a single processor. Assume that none of the processes are dependent on any of the others. So we see how long each one takes. Which of the following best approximates the minimum possible time to execute all three processes when two of them are run in parallel? So you're thinking about which two do I want to run in parallel so that I'm the most efficient. That's what I would be thinking about here. So which two would be the most efficient to put together so that we could minimize the amount of time? All right, the answer is 80 seconds. Now, the reason why, remember they were saying, if we put them all separate, they would have to be done, if they were done sequentially, we would add them all up. If I can put two of them on one processor, then what I can do is put the two fastest on the same one, 30 and 50. And yes, that one will take 80, the other one will only take 60, but I'll still need 80 seconds if I put two on the same, okay? So let's see where we're at. Ooh, that leaderboard's all over the place. Amiable Yak went up 49 places. Woohoo! Space Urchin took the lead. Here we go. A user enters a web address in a browser, and a request for a file is sent to a web server. Which of the following best describes how the file is sent to the user? You might want to think a little bit about some of the things you've seen in previous videos or maybe about the ducks that we saw being transmitted over to see if that helps you think about what's happening in words. Almost there. Going to be closed in just a moment. Here we go. So remember, we had to divide it up into packets. That's why we had multiple ducks. And also remember, the user's browser must re request each packet in order. Well, that didn't necessarily happen. That's why we had the protocol to take care of that. So our answer is A, the file is broken into packets and must be reassembled upon receipt. Here we go. Noble Unicorn, three correct in a row. Space Urchin, still in the lead. Here we go, let's get ready. Two computers are built by different manufacturers. One is running a web server and the other is running a web browser. Which of the following best describes the ability of the two computers to communicate with each other across the internet? So we see the word protocols in a lot of these. So you wanna think about what's important about protocols. Maybe if you think about protocols, it'll help you remember what the answer is.
We'll be closing shortly, so get your answers in. Here we go, and boom. So the internet protocol does allow, remember the protocol is open, so it doesn't matter what types of devices they are or who manufactures them, they can communicate directly because the internet communication uses standard protocols. Let's see where we're at. Oh, Space Urchin is not giving up that lead, but Noble Unicorn has the highest streak of four. Let's get ready, and here we go. The figure below represents a network of physically linked computers labeled A through G. A line between two computers indicates that the computers can communicate directly with each other. Any information sent between two computers that are not directly connected must go through at least one other computer. For example, information can be sent directly between computers A and B, because we have a direct line here, but information set between A and C have to go through another computer, either B or E, or could even go more indirectly. What is the minimum number of connections that must be broken or removed in the network before E can no longer communicate with F? So here is E in the middle and F is on the left. What's the least amount of connections that could be uh, that we would need to have broken or removed before E cannot communicate with F. Be closing momentarily, so let's get the answers in. Okay, so we need to uh, do at least three. We needed to disconnect E to F, and then the other two outside with, um, with F, I believe it was. So the two that were on the two sides of F had to also be disconnected. That would be the minimum. If I disconnected more from E, there was always other routes, so I'd need to do a lot more than three. Okay, let's see. Space Urchin, you are not, not giving up. Amiable Yak has the highest answer streak with five. We have some new names on the leaderboard. Let's get ready, here we go. Okay, so again, we have a network. We have A through G. We see the connections. Which of the following statements about security in the network is true? A and D need to communicate with at least two additional computers in the internet or the network to communicate with each other. So A is down here, D is up here. Do I really need to go through two? Computers B and C can communicate with each other without additional computers being aware. Here's B and here's C. Can they directly communicate? So remember when you have Roman numerals, you have to check all the Roman numerals to see what your final answer will be. It's going to close momentarily. Get your final answer in. Remember, you always want to try to answer. And the answer is two only. B and C could connect directly, but A and D could have gone through E, so they didn't need to go through two. They could have only gone through one. So uh, Roman numeral one was not correct, but two was. Let's check our scoreboard. Ooh, not much of a change there, but six players have reached an answer streak of three. Keep it going, everyone. Last question. This is a multi-select. So that means you're gonna have to choose two answers. You'll have to hit submit once you select your second one so it knows that you're done. 
Researchers have developed a simulation of packets traveling between server computers and client computers in a network. Of the following, which two outcomes are most likely to be the results of the simulation? Select two answers. Always remember when you see select two, don't get too fast and only answer one. There's no partial credit. You have to have both of them correct in order to get the points, the point for a question like this. So if you have one of them correct, there's no partial credit, I'm sorry to say. We're down, it's gonna close in about 10 seconds. So give your best answers. Remember, you never leave a multiple choice blank. You always wanna have an answer and take a chance that you'll get it right. There's no penalty for wrong answers. These were our two correct ones, better understanding of the effect of temporarily unavailable network and better understanding of the impact of increased connection speeds. It doesn't tell us anything about the binary data and it doesn't tell us the impact of public data and solutions. So let's see our final podium. Here we go. In third place, Fearless Camel. In second place, Soaring Sea Lion. Oh, and with a perfect score, Dun, da, 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 space urchin. Excellent job, everyone. Excellent job. I really appreciate you taking the time to work on that. So what should we take away? We want you to be able to explain how computing devices work together in a network, how the internet works, and how data are sent through internet via packets. We also want you to understand the difference between the internet and the World Wide Web. Remember, the World Wide Web uses the internet. For fault tolerance systems like the internet, describe the benefits, how the system's fault tolerant, and any vulnerabilities there are. And of course, we have our sequential, parallel, and distributed computing. We wanna be able to compare solutions, and determine the efficiency of solutions. So there's a lot of stuff in this. We don't want you to feel overwhelmed, but we do want you to make sure that you feel comfortable with it all. Don't forget, you can use this feedback form to send information about questions you have, what you enjoyed, suggestions, and give us an idea of how you felt about it. Um, you can put any information, you can pretty much answer it all in these first questions. Don't forget to access the drive because that does have information about each of the uh, videos that we've done, as well as the link for feedback and the resources page to help you get to other videos or remind you about other things. So I want to thank you for coming. Remember, there is not a video, a live video tomorrow. Fridays, we don't have live videos. However, you might want to use tomorrow if you missed a previous video, or if you're taking more than one AP exam, you might need some time to catch up for the different courses. I personally will be back on Tuesday, the 27th next week to talk about some parts of Big Idea 5, programming fundamentals and algorithms. On Monday, Julia Lana will be back for a review and practice of, the, uh, of information about the digital divide, crowdsourcing, legal and ethical concerns, and safe computing. So those of you who asked specifically about some of those issues in terms of phishing and key logging, that will be covered in Monday's video. Thank you so much for coming in and viewing. I hope you'll watch the rest of our videos, whether it's live or on demand. In the meantime, have some fun with CS and know you've got this. Go CS principles.